Hey everyone, welcome to episode 6. Today's episode was originally going to be about the Commodore 64, but last minute delivery came in with some C64 stuff that I wanted to include in the video, so instead we're going to go over something just as good if not better. That's right, the Commodore Amiga, specifically the A500. The one featured in this video actually has some mods done to it, and we'll go over what they do later on. Growing up, I was always interested in the Amiga, but by then, the PC and the Mac have kind of taken over the market share and snuffed out most of the competition, at least here in North America. But in Europe, the Amiga line continued on for a few more years, not surprising considering the Commodore 64 and related machines were very popular there. But because of the effect of duopoly here in North America, between the PC and the Mac market, the Amiga didn't really catch on well enough to sustain any meaningful market share, and ultimately led to not only its demise, but Commodore as a whole. Again, at least here in North America. Which is a shame, because just with the C64, the Amiga line was designed to be a cost-effective option for home computing market. I may do a retrospective on Commodore as a whole in the future. Anyway, the Amiga 500 was the first low-end Amiga, and was released first in the Netherlands in April of 1987, with the US release later that October. It retailed just under $700, which is about $1,500 in today's money. It was also the first Amiga to be sold in standard retail markets, similar to the C64. So in other words, Sears and stores like that, making it more accessible to the average consumer. Other Amigas were pretty much only sold via computer shop and mail order catalogs. It also went back to the computer keyboard combo that the C64 and related utilized. The design even seems to be an evolutionary step forward from the C64C and the C128, whereas the Amiga 1000 resembled more of a standard PC for the time. The RGB monitor was separate and retailed for roughly $300, which would be around $700 today. However, the A500 did come with the A520RF modulator, not only allowing it to connect to most televisions and antenna port, similar to gaming consoles of the time, but also had a composite video output as well for somewhat of a sharper image. The A500 was discontinued in 1992 and was replaced with the A600 and shortly after that the A1200, but neither were as successful as by this time PCs and lower cost Macs have started dominating the market. One note about the Amiga, it's not compatible with most PC monitors as their frequencies don't match up. Now there are some monitors known as multi-sync monitors that can handle the Amiga's output, but they were limited in availability. But if you happen to have one and you pick up an adapter, you could use that instead of the official Amiga monitor. The A500 released with a Motorola 68000 based CPU, similar to several Macs and gaming consoles such as the Sega Genesis. This could be directly upgraded to a 68010 or a 68020, 30, or 40 the expansion card or a CPU socket adapter. This was because starting with the 6820, Motorola CPUs no longer used dip sockets. It came stock with 512 kilobytes of RAM, though it could be expanded to up to 9 megabytes. Adding at least 2 megabytes would allow you to run Amiga OS 3.1.4, otherwise it supported Amiga OS 1.2 and 1.3. It could output graphics with a resolution of 368 by 483 with roughly 56 colors on screen, all the way up to 736 by 483 resolution with 16 colors. Later revisions could support up to 256 colors. There were some special modes that allowed for use of all 4096 colors supported by the Amiga. It also supported stereo audio via two RCA jacks. It came with a floppy disk drive capable of reading PC720K disks and Amiga 880K disks, or its special drivers could format a disk to support up to 984K. It did not come with a hard drive, though options were available for this via the side expansion slot. So now on to the good stuff. Let's take apart the A500 and figure out what these mods could possibly be. This is the Amiga 500, as you've seen in the in a previous uh, pickups video. Uh, I've always wanted one of these. Like, not even kidding. Like, I remember being a teenager reading computer magazines and seeing these and always wondering what they were all about, why, you know, they were being featured and everything, especially since the entire world at that point was uh, starting to run on Mac and Windows. Although this is an earlier model, so this would have been newer at the time, and if you see it, it looks kind of familiar, that's because it's a similar design to, actually I would say more of an evolutionary design from the Commodore 64C and the Commodore 128. Now that's not to be confused with the Commodore 64, which was considered a Breadman style. The 64C looked a little bit more like this. The C was the uh, basically for compact. So 
Anyway, this is the next iteration in, in Commodore's line, the Commodore Amiga. This is the 500, and this particular model that I got on eBay came modified. And we'll get into these in a bit. I'm not sure exactly which mods, but I'm pretty sure. But I'll have to open it up to find out. As you can see, it's a little yellow, though it's not too bad. At least not compared to the slot cover here. But it should be a little bit brighter. Now, I don't know if I want to do anything about that. If I want to retro bright it or not. We'll see. I may do something with this cover just to even it out with this. But as far as the overall system, I'm not sure I want to do anything with it. But like I said, we'll see. I have not opened this up yet. Pretty much what you see is going to be the first time I'm seeing it as well, too. So we'll see how to do all of this. Now, before I go and actually open it up, I need a flathead screwdriver. Yeah, see, I don't even know how to. I think there's a supposed to be a clip or something that maybe it broke off, or maybe that's just it. So this does have some sort of an expansion card. I believe this is just a memory card. I don't know if I want to just pull this out though, as I am not sure if there's anything wired to it as part of the other mods. It doesn't look like it though. Let's take a look anyway. Yeah, so just RAM expansion. And this has a CR2032 battery on it to help with clock keeping, time keeping settings, various other things. In this case, I think it's just for timing, but I don't hold me to that. I might have to replace it. I don't know if this how old this battery is. Uh, this battery is from September of 1989. So yeah, this battery is getting replaced. And if you saw my uh, video on how to replace a battery in your video game collection, your cartridges, it's going to be the same process. So I'm just going to have to desolder these two tabs here and go from there. In fact, this battery might have been replaced already once because you can kind of see some of the flux residue on there. Although it's possible it came like that from the factory. We'll see. I'll set this to the side though. And you can see some of these wires here from the switches that were installed. So this is missing one screw already here. And in fact, it looks like it's got Torx and Phillips that could be standard. I think the Phillips are there to hold the floppy drive in. That one's missing as well. I don't know what's supposed to be there. I don't know if there's anything under these feet. So we'll take a look at that as well and see if there are screws there too. But I really don't want to just rip this open and apparently that's all I have to do. So the case is roughly the same color inside as is on the outside so it's possible this just is supposed to be this creamy color. So let's see, disconnect the keyboard, looks like it's got a ground connection on it, standard Phillips, and they grounded it to the floppy drive. So we'll put this screw back in here so I don't lose it. Or the keyboard itself. I'll take the keycaps off in a little bit to, ch to take a look underneath theirs. But I can see some dust already, so this might need to be cleaned. It won't have to be too big of a deal. This system overall is not dirty. Not like some of the other systems that I've seen in the past. Okay, so I believe that this is a dual kickstart just kind of like a BIOS, like in a computer, but there's more to it than that. And, you know, it's probably closer to a system ROM that the older Macs had than it is a BIOS, but, you know. And that's, so that switch here controls both of those. You can switch between one or the other. And then this connect cable here is probably 
for switching to low mem and high low mem and high mem. I believe those are the terms in the Commodore or the Amiga universe. Now it doesn't look like this board is actually secured by any screws. These two are missing here. This one's missing here. I know the floppy drive is being secured and that's the only thing holding the board down. Now looking at the capacitors, they don't look like they've leaked at all, which is really good because let's see. So that's a good sign. It's also possible that this might have been fixed up already once. There's another bodge wire over here, jumper wire, whatever you want to call it. So this particular Amiga, the drive uh, gets power separately from here, but some, on some Amigas, I think, and I know on some other retro computers, the uh, floppy drive cable will also provide power. But overall, this board looks like it's in good shape. I don't, again, I don't see anything here. I just want to double check on these mods that are done. Looked them up online and uh, I'll see what they do. I'm not sure if the floppy drive works. I was given a set of floppy disks. It does look a little dirty in there. I might have to take it apart and clean it, which will require using some IPA, isopropyl alcohol. But we'll see. Otherwise, there's really not much else to look at here. Okay, so I have footage of the reassembly technically, but both cameras were recording blurry images for some reason. I'm not sure why. I don't suspect the lighting because it's the same lighting I usually have. It was just out of focus. I'm not sure. However, I got it cleaned up as best as I could, though it wasn't really that dirty to begin with, so it didn't take too long. I also replaced the RTC battery on the RAM expansion board. I didn't record that at all, though, because I had just released a video the prior week on how to replace the battery in your video game cartridges, and the process is exactly the same. But if you missed that video, I'll post a link in the description so you can go back and take a look. I do have some additional footage of it booting up and me struggling to get it to boot from the floppy disk. Turns out when I took it apart to clean it, I didn't put it back together quite the right way. Once I figured that out, it booted up just fine. Unfortunately, I discovered another issue, and that's that I couldn't get the mouse to work correctly. It would scroll left and right, and the buttons would work, but it would not scroll up or down. I took the Amiga apart again, took a look at all the traces, capacitors, anything that I might have missed, and it doesn't seem like anything was wrong. I did touch up a couple of solder points just to be safe, but there was just nothing obvious to me that might be the issue. Now there could be an issue with one of the chips, but I'm really hoping not because they're not that easy to source. Now I also took the mouse apart, and I realized that someone had been in here before because there were some modifications done. So I went over the modifications and made any minor corrections that I could to try to resolve the issue. Nothing worked, unfortunately. I'm gonna to try to source another mouse, but that means that I won't be able to show you the fully working unit today. Which is probably fine considering I don't have any other software to show off either. You would just be staring at the Amiga OS screen the entire time. So we're going to have to end the video here unfortunately. However, I did have a lot of fun looking around inside and poking around and learning about the Amiga in general. And I'm going to continue learning a bit more, especially once I get a mouse, so I can actually operate the machine the way it was intended to. And also try to pick up some software so I can show that off too. I mean, what good is a computer without software, right? At the very least, some games. You know, I kind of really wish the Amiga line had succeeded. We may have three different standards today if it had. So you'd have PC, Mac, and then Amiga. The retro community has definitely taken a liking to the Amiga line, just as it had with the C64 and Classic Macs. Not a surprise there, though. I mean, you can get replacement cases, replacement motherboards, modern accelerated cards, and so much more. And you may be surprised to learn you can still purchase the Amiga OS, However, licensing is a little confusing subject as different parts of Commodore, and more specifically the Amiga brand, were sold to different companies and investors throughout the years. I'm not going to even try to decipher the entire mess that's the Amiga operating system, but what I'll do instead is I'll link to a PDF and a forum post so you can read up more about it if you want to. Oh, and there's also a community-driven project known as AROS that attempts to keep the Amiga spirit alive and maintains compatibility with the original Amiga OS. So other than a follow-up video with a working mouse and some software, I'm going to probably revisit this machine in the future as well, because I plan on getting a few additional things for it, such as a GoTek floppy drive emulator, possible CPU upgrades, RAM upgrades, and maybe even a hard drive. So that's it for today. Keep an eye out for the follow-up coming up, hopefully within the next few weeks, once I source that mouse. Hit the thumbs up if you liked the video, and feel free to subscribe. If you didn't like the video, hit the thumbs down, but please leave a comment as to why, so I can make improvements in the future. Thanks all, and I'll catch you later.